Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Smith, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Trust and Estates section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. I am very pleased to welcome everyone to our presentation today entitled Subtrust Allocation for Litigation Attorneys put on by retired Judge Glenn Reeser. Before we begin, we have a few housekeeping announcements. You will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Your certificate will also be stored in BHBA Plus, our members only community. Please take a moment to complete the survey that is included with your certificate. And now I would like to introduce our sponsors, starting with Nancy Sanborn and Brian Joy of the Sanborn team. Okay, Happy New Year, everyone. We're looking forward to continuing to work with you in 2023. And the Sanborn team would like to share some very exciting news with you. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services has received approval from the Department of Real Estate to form a probate division that we have been named the directors of. The division has identified agents throughout our network, which covers most of California, who have experience in handling sales that are subject to probate, trust, and conservatorships. Please feel free to reach out to us with any real estate needs anywhere in California. So on another front, we hate to keep beating a dead horse, but once again, we want to stress not only the importance of getting a preliminary title report in advance, but also reading every hyperlink. Recently, we had a sale being confirmed in court, and at the last minute, it was pointed out that one of the hyperlinks contained a document with a first right of refusal. Needless to say, we had to delay the sale, and um, but we were able to resolve the issue. Lesson learned, read every link. Anyway, have a great meeting, you guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you very much, Nancy and Brian. And now I'd like to turn things over to Arit Gadish of Geffen Real Estate. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. I'm Arit Gadish, broker and owner of Geffen Real Estate, specializing in representing trustees, executors, and administrators. Just last week, I closed on a probate sale that required court confirmation. The overbidder in court was an owner-occupant obtaining FHA financing. I negotiated for the buyer to pay for any lender-required repairs using a vendor approved by the seller. Despite the holidays, we were able to close on time, and the property was in poor condition. It had an illegal addition, old and stained carpets, lots of discoloration throughout, missing kitchen, cabinet drawers, and, and doors, and peeling paint. This was a typical probate with years and years of deferred maintenance. The appraiser called out only two repairs to be made, install the kitchen cabinet doors and drawers, and remediate the peeling paint, which were handled by licensed and insured vendor for $7,000 paid for by the buyer, and we were able to close swiftly. So next time you have a property to sell that's in poor condition, make sure to be flexible with buyers who are obtaining financing. Most often their offer prices are much higher than those of the cash investors and results in a greater return to the trust or estate. I'm happy to help you with any of your real estate needs, residential or commercial, as is or renovated sales strategies with no cost up front to the estates. Also, if you'd like to connect with me on Zoom or get together for coffee or lunch, please reach out to me. My contact info is in the chat box. Enjoy your program and back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Arit. And in addition to the Sanborn team and Geffen Real Estate, the Trust and Estate section is also sponsored by Glen Oaks Escrow. Marcine Klein is a full service escrow officer specializing in probate, trust sales, conservatorship, and both court and independent administration of estate act transactions. On a daily basis, Marcine works to ensure that even the most challenging escrows close smoothly and that her clients are beyond happy with their experience at Glen Oaks Escrow. And we're also sponsored by California Title Company. California Title Company provides comprehensive and timely title insurance protection for home buyers, including first time home buyers, sellers, veterans, and military personnel, seniors, real estate agents and brokers, mortgage lenders, and commercial real estate professionals. And also, I'd like to tell you about our upcoming program. Uh, next month, the Trust and Estate section will be putting on a program on February 21st when Anna Solomon and Brian Kirk of Fiduciary Trust International will give their presentation entitled Trust Reformation and Decanting Update. So I hope that everyone will be able to attend that presentation as well. And now I will turn things over to our legal update co-chair, Teal Schoonover, who will provide our legal updates. Hi everyone, this is Teal Schoonover. I have two cases uh, for legal updates for January right now. The first one is Chewy versus Chewy, Court of Appeal case number B308574. 
Um, uh, Second District Division One filed November 30th, 2022. Um, in this case, Jacqueline and Michael Chewy were beneficiaries of a trust when they were 10 and eight years old, respectively. The probate court appointed Jackson Chen as their guardian ad litem in connection with litigation concerning the trust. When they were 17 and 16 years old, respectively, they retained attorneys and filed petitions to have Chen removed as their guardian ad litem. Chen responded by filing motions to strike the petition and to disqualify Jacqueline and Michael's attorneys. The court granted the motions to disqualify the attorneys and struck their removal petitions. Jacqueline and Michael appealed, and in the meantime, both reached the age of majority. The appellate court reversed the order striking the removal petitions and directed the trial court to terminate Jackson's appointment as guardian ad litem. The provisions of guardianship and conservatorship law support a minor's right to petition for removal of his or her guardian ad litem, despite there being no substantive or procedural provisions governing removal of a guardian ad litem in the probate code. Um, the second case is Wessner versus Sternigan, Court of Appeal case number D079623, um, the 4th District Division 1. This one was filed December 28, 2022. Um, this is a case pertaining to issues around intestate succession and the presumption of a natural parentage. In this case, Shannon, the petitioner, was the decedent's cousin and claimed to be the sole heir to his estate. Judy objected to Shannon's petition and claimed, and claimed to be sole heir on the basis that she qualified as a natural heir because she was held out as a natural child by the decedent's uncle, Charles. Judy's position was that she was entitled to one half of the decedent's estate as the issue of the decedent's maternal grandparents. The probate court determined that Judy was an intestate heir by clearing convincing evidence. Charles received Judy into his home in Indiana and openly held her out as his natural child including in his last will and testament and in public records dating back to the 1960s. As such, he was presumed to be Judy's natural parent, making her an heir at law to the decedent's estate. The appellate court affirmed this decision. The court found that the presumption of natural parentage cannot be rebutted solely on the basis of public policy grounds, and that Shannon failed to proffer any facts to rebut the presumption. The appellate court also rejected Shannon's argument that California law should not apply because the parent-child relationship took place in Indiana and not California. Um, California law applies to determine parentage related claims of heirship for a decedent domiciled in California at death. Furthermore, California's public policy encourages protection and preservation of the parent-child relationship, and the result under Indiana law should have no effect on California's position. So those are our two legal updates, and I will now pass the mic on to David. Thank you. Thank you, Teal. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Judge Glenn Reeser. Judge Reeser currently works with Jans as a mediator principally resolving family trust litigation cases. Before becoming a judge, uh, Judge Reeser worked, with, worked more than two decades as a litigation attorney, representing clients in cases including complex trust matters. As a trial judge for an additional two decades, Judge Reeser exclusively handled trust, probate, and conservatorship matters for the majority of that tenure. As a mediator with JAMS, Judge Reeser managed the litigation resolution affirmed in Breslin v. Breslin. J judge Reeser continues to serve as a judicial trainer for all judges in California assigned to the probate bench with an emphasis in trusts and, a conserv and conservatorships. So in other words, you're learning this material from the same source that your judge is learning it from. With no further ado, here is Judge Reeser. So th thank you, David. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I'm looking at my participant list. There's a lot of my peeps and and uh, heavy hitters on that list. Um, I see Jonathan Rosenblum is there, and he's he is the new generation, and hopefully um, he'll he will get involved in um, in the probate curriculum committee as well, uh, because he has a, a formidable background in trusts and estates. Uh, so so the um, let me put my PowerPoint up. So I first took judge classes in trust and probate in 2001. And, and, and when I did that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a course that at least through last year, I continued to teach. Um, but we bring in judges from all, you know, disciplines. We bring in judges from from criminal law, and we bring in judges who've been working, uh, hopefully, on a family on a calendar. Uh, some of them have been perhaps doing dependency. Uh, a lot of judges come in to trust and probate from civil, uh, which is a different way of walking, talking, and thinking. Uh, but we teach the class, and, and you know, the, for orientation, 
uh, for judges coming into the assignment. It's, it's a week long, but we only spend a day and now less than a day on trust. And it's a bit of a, of a triage. Uh, so after, you know, a number of years serving uh, as the sole trust and probate judge in my court, uh, someone asked me, they said, um, you know, if there was a class that you wish you had taken a long time ago, what would that be? And so that was the, the genesis of this course, because uh, judges, when they're sitting on the bench, uh, and Jonathan will tell you, right, every trust case has a trust in it, and all the trusts are different. They're like snowflakes to some degree, uh, but to another degree, they are, they are um, analogous to one another. Uh, but as you read these trusts and you're new to the assignment, uh, you know, you're reading pages and, and paragraphs and articles. Uh, you know, sometimes they're original trusts, sometimes they're restatements, sometimes they're amendments. It doesn't really matter. But uh, no one really sits down with the judges and explains to them the, you know, a bit of a deep dive into what these documents actually are and why they're written the way that they're written. And, and so uh, in, in my practice as a neutral, I, I am seeing a, a, I'll call it an increase in the number of matters where the attorneys litigating trust are becoming, I think, more sophisticated on subtrust allocation issues. And so I'm seeing a lot more of those cases around uh, and uh, questions are being asked uh, because the, I think there's a just general perception that our state planners, and I'm sure there are a lot of them in, in our in our participant group today, uh, that they just do estate planning. And yes, they do, but they do a lot of very creative, complicated and nuanced things. And one of the things that they do that is very uh, complicated and creative is subtrust allocation. And it's, it's behind the scenes, it's, it doesn't happen in court. And the only time you ever really see it in court is, is when it's being litigated. So for my litigators out there, uh, as you're considering uh, a client who comes into your office who is uh, mad about something, uh, one thing that they may be mad about is, is how the uh, tr trust assets were divided between the subtrust. So, so that's a, a, a long uh, intro to, to where I'm going to um, where I'm going to take this course. Uh, so the first question is, why is you know, why are there even subtrusts? Uh, and it really actually goes back to Mr. Franklin, who said that uh, in the 1700s, our new constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. And so the intersect, right, of death and taxes and trust comes in the form of what we call an AB or an ABC trust. And we're gonna do a little bit of a dive into that, uh, particularly for my litigators. Now, a lot of, you know, what I'm about to talk about is gonna be second nature to the estate planners who are gonna say, I already know that. And the answer is yes, you do already know that, but it, this course will hopefully be helpful uh, so you can see how your subtrust allocation models may uh, wind up in litigation. So, so getting to some basic concepts for my estate planners, but some complicated concepts to some of, especially my young attorneys, uh, everyone knows, right, that estates of a certain value have to pay death taxes. And there's an unlimited deduction for all the property that passes to the surviving spouse. It doesn't mean that the surviving spouse is going to avoid taxes on their passing. It just is a deferment uh, protocol. So it doesn't eliminate the taxes uh, with respect to the marital deduction. But in addition to this concept of uh, state tax marital deduction, there's a term called lifetime credit. And every person has a lifetime credit called the estate tax exemption equivalent. It sounds really comp complicated, but it's a number that relates to the year in which the person passes and that is their lifetime credit uh, for the avoidance of estate taxes, right? 
So, and then to, to further complicate matters, and this is a bit of Alice's rabbit hole that we're diving into now, uh, pro, uh, if the entire state passed to the surviving spouse without the first spouse to pass taking their lifetime exemption, uh, that exemption was lost prior to 2012, but not after 2012. Okay. So this is a really cool chart. And uh, it, it, it is a bit of the history of how America has been subsidized in the last 107 years, right? But it shows you that in 1916, there was this thing called the estate tax that was established around the country. And in 1916, you know, $50,000 per person was a very large estate. I mean, it's massive. Uh, and the government, the Congress decided to tax Americans above that exemption sum at 10%, right? And so uh, you can see from the chart that the $50,000 stayed pretty constant, except uh, prior to the Depression. And then after the Depression, it returned to the $50,000, even went down to $40,000 uh, as the estate tax threshold. Uh, so, you know, even though... Um, money was worth less as time as time went on uh the estate tax stayed constant in terms of its its uh its floor threshold right but but if you look at 1942 to 1976 right the estate tax exemption was sixty thousand dollars a person and in 1976 sixty thousand dollars a person was a lot different than fifty thousand dollars a person in 1916 uh and instead of ten percent the tax rate was 77% all the way through 1976. And so you'll see that in subsidizing the American economy, as of 1977, wealthy people, uh, even people which weren't wealthy because you know $60,000, a lot of people fell within that category in 1976, uh, they were paying a huge portion of their estates in estate tax. So that has completely flipped uh, to the point now that it's only the very, 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 very wealthy who are paying estate taxes and certainly not at 77% of the taxable estate. So, so you will see on the chart as we move uh, through the latter part of the 20th century and into this century, uh, the estate tax threshold has gone up. Uh, so I've, I've augmented that chart in the, on the bottom of the screen. So as of this year, each person's estate tax exemption uh, credit is $12.92 million and 40% of the estate above that sum is taxed and everything within the 12.92 uh, is gonna be exempt from tax. So, so that's important, right? So it's only the really, really wealthy people now who are subject to estate tax. Hasn't always been that way. Uh, and so um, as this has evolved, the estate planners being very creative, uh, developed the concept of what we call the AV trust. And so the A trust, uh, if someone says A trust, almost invariably, that means a survivor subtrust. And if they say B trust, almost invariably, that means what we call a bypass trust or decedent's trust. There's a boatload of names that we use for the bypass. And then we have this also C trust. Um, so, so the idea behind AB trust really is that uh, a trust was created, a subtrust was created to take advantage of the estate tax exemption and a revocable living trust became prominent. I mean, I've been around a long time uh, certainly when I started practicing in the 1970s, they were very prominent uh, and all the way through 2012. And even since then, they are still largely utilized under specific circumstances. So lawyers, because it's complicated and clients, you know, as they come into the office, don't typically understand what an AB trust is. They've made various attempts at trying to chart it out so this is a 2015 chart because you'll see the exemption here was 5.43 million. But um, a better chart was, the, I, I found this one online, um, 
my, my um, yeah, you can ignore my little photographs. There's one, the top one is, is the first spouse is passing. And my second photograph is post-mortem there for the first spouse. But uh, you'll see on the chart here, um, the A trust is the survivor's trust. And then the B trust is the bypass or the decedent's trust. And uh, it says, you know, on the first death, the trust is divided into A and B subtrust and that there's no federal state taxes which are paid on the first death. Uh, the assets that get put into the, the uh, subtrust of the spouse who died, the B trust, you see that it says assets remaining in the bypass trust will bypass the taxable estate, but are subject to capital gains tax upon sale because no second step up in basis. Okay, so now all of a sudden, in addition to estate taxes, when we do these analyses, we're also talking about the capital gains tax uh, because uh, assets that get put into the bypass trust, uh, there is a step up in basis, but only to the first spouse's death. Assets that stay in the survivor's trust get a second step up in basis at the time of the second spouse's passing. Uh, these are things that a judge ultimately learns after years of sitting on the bench, but they're not necessarily uh, intuitive. The A trust, uh, the survivor's trust, it says here assets remaining uh, may be subject to a state tax if greater than the exemption amount, right? Of course. And they get a second step up in basis. And beneficiaries of the A trust may be different than beneficiaries of the B and C trust. Uh, okay, so I want to... For those people who are uninitiated, most of you are initiated, so a C trust, right? Typically, not invariably, but typically a, an AB trust allocates assets in terms of value. Uh, each spouse gets their share of the community. That's one half, right? And each spouse typically is given their separate property to fund their subtrust. Now, there are trusts, as many of you know, that have uh, uh, transmutation provisions that make everything community. But uh, you know, generally, uh, in, in an AB trust, the surviving spouse is entitled to income from both subtrusts during the a lifetime of the surviving spouse. So regardless of how assets are allocated, the surviving spouse typically gets income. There are rules which talk about principal invasion, which I'm not going to get into today. But there's this thing called the C trust, right? Because, because the idea of the B trust is to fall within the exemption sum for the year of the first spouse's passing. But if you add up that spouse's share of the community and all their separate property, Sometimes it's more than the exemption amount. And so what do you do with that? Uh, and that, uh, because again, based on the tax laws and the way Congress has set up the Internal Revenue Code, allows for what they call a Q-tip trust or a C-trust. And the C-trust is supposed to take in those assets that belong on the first, on the, the, I'll call it the decedent side that are in excess of the, the federal exemption amount in the year of their passing. Uh, and so it, it's really complicated for judges and for new lawyers who are getting into the legational area because th there's tax law amalgamated, you know, with um, with estate planning. So there are very few cases, even though there are a number of cases in which some trust allocation is being litigated. There's very few cases that even try to explain uh, to lawyers, litigants, uh, what a an AB trust is, right? And so uh, our our now uh, departing chief uh, tried to uh, articulate what an AB trust was in in the Donkin case, which you know I'm unfortunately familiar with, and and perhaps you know Jonathan is, and and, and a number of lawyers in the room because it's a case that keeps on giving, but. Um, it's what now 13 or 14 years in the that's 2012 it's yeah it's 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 older than many of your kids so um the chief justice uh, and this is the only reading that i'm going to do tries to define what an ab trust is 
And she says in Duncan, and, and again, this is the most elemental way of saying it, which is still complicated. Federal law allows the property of a deceased spouse to be passed to the surviving spouse without payment of a federal estate tax through the allowance of a marital deduction. And she cites the Internal Revenue Code. The value of the estate of the surviving spouse is increased by such a passage of assets, and it may be enlarged to the point where it will exceed the federal unified tax credit allowable to the estate when the surviving spouse dies. And now she cites both tax code and CEB books. A common method of addressing such a situation, having the purpose of minimizing estate taxes owed, is to provide for the transfer to the surviving spouse of only as much of the deceased spouse's property as necessary to reduce the deceased spouse's estate tax to zero with the use of the applicable federal estate tax exemption. Remember, because before 2012, it was lost uh, if it wasn't taken on the death of the first spouse. Uh, the property remaining in the deceased spouse's estate is placed in a bypass trust which makes those assets available for, this, for, for the surviving spouse's use, right? Lifetime income, but does not give the surviving spouse rights to the property in the bypass trust that would cause any of the undistributed trust property to be included in the taxable estate of the survivor spouse on his or her death, and then citing a boatload of CEB tax and the revenue code. Thus, the undistributed assets of the decedent's estate bypass the survivor's estate. To avoid federal estate tax inclusion in the surviving spouse's estate, the bypass trust must be, and this is important, irrevocable and unamendable on or after the first spouse's death. So there are the hallmarks of the bypass trust, right? Once the first spouse dies, in order to qualify for all these tax advantages, it has to be irrevocable and unamendable. And of course, those of you who are experienced in, in mediation know that sometimes, you know, we can do workarounds and do some uh, amendments of uh, testamentary documents as part of settlements, but otherwise uh, amending an irrevocable trust has to fall within one of several statutory subcategories, uh, none of which are, are expansive. So what is subtrust funding? It's the funding of a deceased spouse's share of trust assets into one or more subtrusts. And there you have a, a good depiction of it. And so, okay, subtrust allocation, it's no, normally only a problem where the class of subtrust beneficiaries is different. So if you see the three triplets on the left, if the A trust and the B trust give all, you know, all of their uh, residue uh, to those three beneficiaries and there's no changes, that's typically not gonna be a subtrust allocation problem regardless of how things are allocated. On the right, lower right, where you see Anna Nicole Simpson and her departed beloved, uh, that's a problem right? Because that shows a survivor's trust that's amended, uh, contrary to what would have been the, the gentleman's um, prior uh, AB or ABC trust, in this case, ABC. So uh, subtrust allocation, likewise, is normally only a problem where the assets are not allocated pro rata, meaning if there's three beneficiaries dividing everything three ways, every asset is divided one, you know, uh, the assets themselves are allocated between the A and the B trust, one half, one half, uh, or if it's ABC, uh, it would be divided uh, similarly, one half, one half, but uh, that is between the A and the B and the C, but uh, normally if it's not a problem if everything is divided equally, but that's not how it works typically works because our state planners are too nuanced for that. So uh, the survivor, right, because one spouse is deceased, has to divide the trust corpus into subtrust. So where is that a problem? Well, what happens when the successor doesn't allocate? 
because not every um, settlor or set of co-settlors goes to one of your offices to create their estate plan. Sometimes they'll go to a chicken dinner where annuities are being sold and they get a big book, you know, in a, in a binder. Uh, and maybe they'll buy a variable annuity or maybe they won't on their cross marketing. But uh, once the first spouse passes, no one tells them, hey, you know what, get over to the lawyer's office to figure out how to allocate into the AB trust, subtrust. And what about the people who do it online? Are they cognizant of, you know, how to how to do subtrust allocation? And just what happens when a lawyer drafts a, a trust, an AB trust for a couple, and you know, the lawyers doesn't check, doesn't read the obituaries every day. Um, I mean, maybe some do, uh, but you know, they don't know when the first spouse passes. So unless the spouse contacts the estate planner uh, or the estate planner's office then you know there could not there may not be an allocation and that happens a lot where there's no subtrust allocation but they're supposed to be okay so what happens in that circumstance second situation what happens when the survivor gives his kids or her kids uh the good stuff right and uh, meaning, you know, if it's a blended family, uh, what if you just start picking and choosing in ways that are beneficial to certain people and not to others, even if they're, uh, the percentages are not controversial? And then who gets to decide what's community and what's separate? Who does all that characterization? Well, it's the surviving spouse. Judge Rosenblum will tell you that he gets, you know, very often spousal set aside petitions where people think they know exactly what's community and what's separate. And I don't want to say more often and not they're wrong, but probably more often and not they're wrong uh, because community property uh, characterization is very, very complicated, uh, especially when you have a, you know, a mixed bag of, of assets, right? Part community, part separate. So, so there's rules that go with subtrust allocation that need to be heeded. All the trust assets on the death of the first spouse have to be inventoried and valued, not just those that you think you need to go into the bypass. You have to value all the assets of the trust. And, um, you know, 706 is a, is a, a, a number. It's not a... Um, it's not the number of the train. It is uh, the number of the the IRS form, um, the federal estate tax return, and that values assets and reflects the allocation. Because once the first spouse passes, and the assets that need to go into the decedent's trust are uh, funded into the bypass trust it becomes a taxable entity. It's a thing, right? So uh, all the assets at the time of the death of the first spouse have to be properly characterized as community or separate, including uh, assets that have both characteristics, right? A, a pre-marital uh, uh, home that uh, as to which community property was utilized to pay down mortgage or there was a refi or there were improvements. I mean, all the reasons why you'd have a more Marsden analytic, uh, very complicated. Uh, each of the subtrusts need to be funded. This is important. And, and uh, we see it quite often in court where, at, where accounts are not properly titled. But as to, you know, liquid assets that go into each of the subtrusts, particularly the irrevocable bypass, the B trust, right? Uh, those, whether it's institutional account or a bank account or whatever, or a piece of real property or percentage of a piece in real property, they need to be properly titled into that subtrust. Uh, separate accounts, asset titling. And, and again, this is, the judges never see this, right? You just have to learn. I mean, you know, Judge Rosenblum been there, did that as a practitioner, but most judges haven't. And so they, you know, it happens outside their purview. So someone has to explain to them, you know, what the rules are and how it happened uh, or how it didn't happen. 
Uh, so a, a, a B trust, right, becomes irrevocable. Uh, exemption trust, that's another word for it. You'll hear it called a lot of things. Um, and a statutory notice is required. A probate code 16061.7, those who are practitioners, and most of you are, it's second nature to you. Uh, notice has to go out to all of the beneficiaries of that subtrust and all of the heirs who would take if the subtrust or the trust were invalid, right? Because it that code section also includes the statute of limitations of 120 days, which which says basically, um, hey, if you're going to challenge this now irrevocable uh, B trust, your time is short, so you better do it quickly. Uh, the B trust needs a taxpayer identification number, has to do annual tax returns, and and this this uh, is typically no thrill to the surviving spouse. The beneficiaries can demand an annual accounting. All right. So let's get to let's get to some of the cases that um, that I've seen that I I think uh, properly you know will will show you the kinds of problems that that you have. So this is a case that I actually adjudicated as a neutral right. Uh, Guy and Heidi uh, were Swiss immigrants moved to Southern California a long, long time ago. Husband and wife, though, uh, they created uh, in the 70s, probably, a standard AB trust. They had three children. Mark, a uh, nice man. He's a law professor in Germany. Uh, he, he learned the Swiss German from his parents, but, you know, learned the high German afterwards. Chris, uh, the, the child who stayed to take care of their mom uh, after dad passed, and Mimi, uh, who moved down to Orange County. Uh, everybody got a third. There was no issue, no problem. There was equality. There was never going to be a problem um, had the, the estate been properly administered after the death of the first spouse. There were 22 assets on the Schedule A. Thankfully, there was a Schedule A. It included, and this is something that Guy had received. Um, uh, he picked up five cottages decades ago on the beach front, beach front bluff uh, at Pacific Beach, which is down in San Diego. Uh, it was pre-code, but this, you know, five rental cottages on one parcel, literally on the overlooking the beach. Uh, the, the couple moved up to Fresno, uh, had a single family residence, and there's a house on Alluvial Drive. You'll see it right there in Fresno. Uh, there, and they had a cabin. They're from Switzerland, right? So they had a cabin up at Shaver Lake, which is the recreational area for folks in Fresno, or at least one of them. And uh, mom, who was a bit of a financial mover and shaker, that's Heidi, she was buying and selling deeds of trust, and uh, she was um, she was managing the family's assets, right? So, guy passed. Uh, the husband died in 2013, but Heidi, you know, she'd been managing the family assets. She doesn't. She said, "I don't need to mess with anything. I was ma managing them before. I'm going to manage them now." Uh, so, after Guy's funeral, she didn't do anything in terms of subtrust allocation. And so, nor did she, um, nor did she make any characterization determinations. So, but what she does do, uh, you know, just a few months after Guy died, she goes, you know, my kids, they're very different. I got one kid is in Europe. I got another kid who's, you know, working in the financial world in Fresno with me on trustees. And I've got a daughter who's down in San Diego and, you know, she needs a little more dough. So, so mom decides unilaterally you know, that, you know, Mark, he's, you know, I'll give him the cabin up at Shaver Lake and he can get half of the liquid assets. And Chris, you know, he he's staying here to take care of me and uh, was here when dad was ill. Uh, he can have the house, in the family home in Fresno, and he can share the liquid assets with Chris. Mimi, you know, she needs a little more um, handholding. So I'm going to create a spendthrift trust for her, but you know, there's those beach cottages, they throw off a boatload of income 
And so I'm going to give that those that asset to her. And then she passes a few years after that. Uh, and it came to me because, you know, both sides were arguing. Uh, Mark and Chris came in and they said, Judge, this is, um, you know, this is an invalid uh, amendment by mom because she had no right to uh, affect the bypass trust. So it's just void. So judge, just ignore it because, you know, obviously this, well, not obviously, but the San Diego assets were worth a lot more than the others, right? So uh, Mimi comes in and says, judge, it's really about in intent. And mom wanted me to have this asset in San Diego. So just give me the assets in San Diego and, you know, and just honor mom's intent because if dad had been alive, dad certainly would have agreed with what mom said, maybe. Uh, so, um, so what happened was, uh, it was the worst result possible because the legal result, which I had to determine was what nobody wanted. Uh, because when dad passed, when guy passed, his half of the community, which was the entirety of that estate was fixed. And there were three beneficiaries and they were equal beneficiaries. So I had to find legally that half of every asset, whether it was the cottages on Pacific Beach, whether it was the house on Alluvial Drive in Fresno, whether it was the Shaver Lake cabin, everybody owned a third of a half of that because that's what the bypass trust said. And it was irrevocable. And, and mom, Heidi, didn't subtrust allocate. But as to the other, as to the survivor's trust, mom can do whatever she wants. It's amendable, right? And so if she wants uh, Mimi to get, you know, all of San Diego, well, she doesn't have all of San Diego to give away. She has half of San Diego to give away. So what happened, the worst result possible because of non-subtrust allocation, Mimi got two thirds of San Diego, right? Because each of her brothers got a sixth of it. Chris got two thirds of alluvial because each of his sibs got a sixth. And uh, a Mark in Europe, he got two thirds of Shaver Lake and his sibs got a sixth. And the, the, the sons shared, got two thirds of the, of the, um, of the liquid assets. Uh, plus, um, well, actually Mimi got a sixth of it. So they got five, six of it. So, so, so that's bad things will happen if you don't allocate at, you know, in an AB trust at the five, at the time of the first spouse is passing, or at least sometime before the second spouse passes. And we'll talk about that in a second. Pro rata versus non pro rata. So, um, black acre, white acre, uh, when the first spouse passes, right, a, a pro, a, a and again, this we, we now have to assume that these are not Los Angeles homes because they're only worth a million dollars each. And they look like in Los Angeles, they'd be worth a lot more. Uh, but let's just assume they each have a value of a million dollars, okay? So a pro rata allocation means that you just create 50% interest in each of the assets. So the house, the Black Acre house would be 50% into the survivor's trust, and 50% into the bypass trust, the B trust, and the same with White Acre, right? A non pro rata allocation, which is typically what estate planners do, or to some degree, what estate planners do, unless they need to make equalizing allocations, is to um, put all of Black Acre in one subtrust and all of White Acre into the other subtrust because it's easier to deal with, you know, in a separate legal entity as a separate asset. Uh, so you will see this quite often, and um, this is where sometimes we can run into some problems, and we're going to talk about that in, right now. So non pro rata allocation, right? Who values the assets on the first spouse's death? Well, the survivor, right? Are the values accurate? Sometimes, a lot of times, maybe. Um, what do you put in the bypass, right? Because appreciate that what goes into the bypass trust are assets that from that point on are going to be exempt from estate tax forever. 
And so if they're being exempt from estate tax forever, there's a school of thought that says you ought to put appreciating assets in there like California real estate, because even if it goes up fivefold, the survivor is going to be free from any uh, survivor's heirs, if you will, but the survivor will be free from any survivor's estate will be free from any estate tax obligation associated with the appreciation of those assets. Uh, can the survivor reallocate at a later date as asset values increase or decrease? You know, intuitively would say no, but the answer is yes, you can reallocate. You may have to amend the 706, but I do see not infrequently um, surviving settlers going, I'm, you know, I'm going to change this around a bit. Uh, and that's why I have the poker chips down there. So, um, so this is a case that's being litigated in LA. So I don't want to say too much about it because it's, it's pendente lite. And, and if this is um, Judge Rosenblum, if this is one of your cases, just close your ears for a while. So, um, uh, so Dell and Jane, uh, you know, married couple for a long time. Dell actually, cool guy. He was, uh, you know, one of the original employees at IBM in the early 60s. And he was like the original guy who did medical billing using cards and then computer systems. So he was a bit of a pioneer. And so he, he did quite well in his life. Two kids. Uh, but then his wife died, right? And then, um, and other things happened. He, his, his daughter took over his, his very large uh, medical billing IT business. Uh, but then he married the neighbor, right? And um, I don't know if, you know, 23 months is a long enough time, but whatever, it, it caused some problems within that family. And so uh, Dell looked at the trust assets and said, you know, I need to reallocate these. And he said, and moreover, he goes, I've, I've overfunded the irrevocable bypassed trust by $2.7 million. So he did move assets over the survivor's trust because he said that they were improperly valued. And among the assets that were moved over included the family home that the kids had grown up in. And then, of course, he had the power to appoint the survivor's trust. And he has a new wife. And we all know that story. So a major lawsuit in, in Los Angeles pending. Uh, and Andrea is claiming that her father, who's still alive, you know, um, that he's breached his fiduciary duties. Uh, because he's in, he's allocated in a way that is um, violent of his fiduciary obligations, not only um, to Jane, who's deceased, but as the trustee of the um, of the bypass trust. So, what happens when you cherry pick the goodies, right? Uh, I'm I'm going to assume that the house on the left is somewhere in Arkansas. And the one on the right has like a uranium deposit, certain things, and maybe they're of equal value. I'll call it the compound on the right. I guess they both could be called compounds, but in different ways. Uh, so this is a case that just got tried in San Diego within the last 90 days that, that I'm very familiar with. So Nick and Tony, after so after the San Francisco earthquake, right, in 1906, uh, the tuna fishing families in, on the Embarcadero in San Francisco, moved their operations to San Diego. They just did. And so San Diego in the last century was the tuna capital of the Pacific, right? And, and so uh, as these families um, uh, were in San Diego for you know way more than 100 years, they acquired a lot of assets, not only on the waterfront near gas lamp, but you know, uh, in the commercial areas uh, real property and so on and so forth, parking lots. And Nick and Tony were both heirs of, of those families. And, and, you know, they didn't have any children, long time marriage, but each of them wanted to give their respective families, uh, their share of their assets. Right. And assets were coming in every which way, but, uh, 
they agreed to transmit everything to community. So that wasn't an issue uh, until Tony became incapacitated. And so Nick needed a new uh, co-trustee of their living trust. So uh, Tony's favorite nephew uh, uh, was brought in. I'm not going to use his name. And, and so he was brought in, uh, but then Nick believed and maybe I believe, but certainly Nick believed that the nephew used Tony's durable power of attorney to personally acquire some of their joint assets. And so Nick said, you're out of here as my co-trustee. And so the nephew, uh, you know, for each action, there's equal opposite reaction, said, I'm going to conserve you, Uncle Nick, and file the conserv a, a conservatorship petition. Uh, but, you know, I learned, uh, you know, half a century ago from a very wise senior partner that you do not shoot at the king and miss. And the um, the nephew missed. And so Nick was not conserved. Uh, so and then his wife passes. So he says, you know what, I'm going to reallocate assets, not to the un that ungrateful nephew side. Uh, but I'm going to put all, most of the real property assets in our estate in my survivor's trust. And I'm going to write a promissory note to the bypass trust for the you know, praise value of what I'm taking out, recognizing two things, right? That all of the lifetime income from both sub trust goes, goes to Nick. So he's paying himself whatever the interest is, number one. But number two, whatever that small interest was, appreciate that real property in San Diego uh, goes up a lot more per year than um, whatever that 2%, 3%, 4% interest rate is. And so that's what happened. And uh, then Nick passes, right? And Tony's relatives, including the bad one, uh, sued the successor trustee saying, yeah, Nick, this sub-trust allocation, you cherry-picked all the really good properties in San Diego. You wrote a promissory note, quote, equalizing promissory note. Uh, we get it that you reflected it on the 706 as amended, but the reality is that you breached your fiduciary duty because you have a duty of impartiality to everybody, including the, 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 the beneficiaries of your uh, sub-trust, but certainly the beneficiaries of the irrevocable bypass trust, and that you breached your duty of impartiality to them by, um, by uh, uh, what, what would be a nice way of putting it, um, getting even with, um, with the nephew. So that went to trial, and while the nephew did get, uh, I think, a bit of um, unclean hands treatment appropriately, uh, there was a fairly meaningful judgment um against the trustee on that just very recently so I'm, that's probably going to go up on appeal i'm sure okay i've got a q a uh oh okay so so judge rosenblum has chimed in right and he may he may have dropped out of the room uh he would add these observations he's surprised not to see more petitions under 15409, collapsing a bypass trust into the survivor's trust where there's family harmony. Survivor has not remarried, no sibling rivalry, and even Stephen allocation and no chance of estate tax liability. Okay, this is important. I'm going to talk about this at the very end. Uh, the bypass trust assets won't get a second step up in basis from the time of the first spouse's death, uh, meaning a potentially large capital gains liability. That's all. That's very true. As for protection of the beneficiaries of the first set lawyers in the room, so isn't it nice to have a judge who actually knows this topic coming in? That's that is so rare in California. You know, one in two hundred. As for protection of the beneficiaries of the first set lawyers in the remarriage scenario, the bypass trust provides some but not complete protection. Think Maginot Line. Surviving spouses, trustee can spend and borrow a substantial amount of the B trust assets. Not a reason to do away with the bypass, but food for thought, right? So my last slide, we're going to talk about that because it's pretty interesting proposition of do you want to go in on a change circumstance petition and ask the judge to 
um, to explode the bypass. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. So um, very frequently our, our survivors trusts are amended. You know, life happens, caregiving is given, codependencies exist. People sometimes get remarried. Even my conservatives sometimes get remarried, my former conservatives, I should say. Uh, sometimes people are talked into um, changes. Other times there's other people pass young and life goes on. So um, quick discussion of community separate property. How do you know what's community and what's separate, right? Uh, do you hire a forensic analyst? Do you do a more Marsden on each of the premarital acquisitions? Uh, do you monetize reimbursements to the deceased spouse on separate property contributions to postmarital acquisitions? James Joyce famously said, what's yours is mine and what's mine is my own. Uh, so the litigator, sometimes if there's an issue, right, you may want to just take a quick uh hire somebody, right? Unless you're an expert who's been in family law, right? Hires an analyst to do a forensic eval uh, if there's some real potential thorny issues as to how assets are characterized. Because obviously the bias of the surviving spouse, uh, well, not obviously, but often the, the bias of the surviving spouse would be to declare arguable assets community. Another interesting point, right? Un unless the trust specifies, the surviving spouse is doing two things. The surviving spouse is managing both the A and the B trust and or C trust to provide income to, to themselves. But they also have a duty to the remainder beneficiaries to keep the trust robust for the remainder, particularly, you know, certainly on the bypass, the B and C trust. And so what if the, if the surviving spouse puts all the income producing assets, non-appreciating assets in the bypass, the B or C, and or C trust, and puts all the appreciating assets in the survivor's trust, right? That's a pretty interesting way to manage a trust. Is it a breach of fiduciary duty? Probably, you know, um, ha have I seen it litigated? Yes. Um, so, so it's interesting. Uh, the, the estate planners who do this are very sophisticated and very nuanced. But there are a lot of considerations that they need to, um, th th there are a lot of factors they need to consider because they don't want there to be liability. They also want to, uh, their client is the surviving spouse, and, but they do also need to let the surviving spouse know that the surviving spouse has a duty uh, of impartiality among the um, among the beneficiaries of the of the bypass. And so it's a bit of a dance you're gonna to have to do on how you allocate things because litigation lawyers, you know, it doesn't take much for them to, to raise an issue uh, because that's certainly my life, you know, and only, I mean, I do exclusively trust and probate mediation every day of the week. And these cases are, you know, they're not legion, but they're not uncommon. So, so how do you litigate, litigate these cases, right? I put a little Swiss army knife over there on the right, but so if your survivor is still alive, your surviving spouse is still alive, um, as, as, a, as a vested remainder beneficiary, you can always petition the court and say, you know, um, I think this subtrust allocation is, is bogus or, you know, is detrimental to uh, the people in, in my position. And you could always ask the court on a petition for instructions to, to fix it, right? Like you don't see that very often because most lawyers, litigation lawyers have a tendency to do the more, um, you know, the, the more, the dance that gets the most recognition, that is the removal slash breach of trust action. But you can always ask the court if the surviving spouse is still alive, can we just fix this? Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a nice way to minimize the um, acrimony 
uh, especially when you're dealing with a surviving spouse, especially when it's your parent, maybe. Um, but even if it's an in-law, you know, a mother, uh, if, if it's a stepmom or stepdad, right, there's a family dynamics in which, which might dictate uh, an instructional petition. What, what if the survivor's conserved, right? Well, that's better uh, because you can always modify an estate plan through a substituted judgment petition under the 2583 factors. The court would look at all of that, including uh, being sensitive to not breaching the, the fiduciary duties of the survivor. So uh, that, that's always a good way to do it. If your surviving spouse is deceased, the successor is not there to fix it. So, uh, but if you're litigating these cases, remember there's limitations periods. There's the one-year statute on uh, the deceased themselves. And then there obviously is the hundred and and uh, the four months on the um, 1606.7. So uh, this is what Judge Rosenblum was referencing. Okay. So starting in 2012, the surviving spouse can defer the lifetime exemption credit of the, of the first spouse to die. You don't lose the credit. It's portable. You can take their credit. It's the Portability Act. Uh, but, you know, estate tax limits are now so high, very few couples even qualify. And there are a lot of estate planners who don't want to do a B estate planning anymore because, you know, a the Portability Act negates in many cases the need to do it. But, but here's but here is the real issue, right? What one spouse typically goes to their grave with the expectation that their kids, even if they're joint kids with the survivor, or if they're not, that their kids are at least going to get their share of the estate. Right. And so that is a comfort to a lot of people because things happen. And so what Judge Rosenblum was saying in his question, right? Uh, well, what if everything is fine? The survivor hasn't remarried, no sibling rivalry, uh, even Stephen allocation. Well, maybe on that day, there's no remarriage. Uh, but what about a year from now? What about five years from now? What about 10 years from now? Uh, I was I got a lot of those petitions as a judge, and my my feeling was, a I would ask them to bring all of the remaindermen into the courtroom, typically even before COVID by Zoom, right? Because they were all over the world, and I'd say, look, you know, right now you are a vested beneficiary of quite often one half of this estate. And if we do this, then all of a sudden the survivor, and, you know, I, I get it. There's there's benefits, especially in terms of capital gains, to kicking it over to the survivor. But you lose your vested rights. And if something happens, you know, uh, some change is made because dad or mom or stepdad or stepmom has the right to amend the survivor's trust till the day they die. Stuff can happen and you could lose your vested interest. Even when they said, yeah, that's all fine, everything's good, we love each other, uh, I would require a side agreement saying from the survivor saying, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change at least that half of the estate because it just seems so risky to me. But and there are a lot of estate planners who tell me that they still do AB trust for the very reason that they are blended families, that they do want the assurance that their kids or their, it doesn't have to be kids, right? It could be charities, it could be anybody, their relatives, their, their brother, their sick cousin, whatever, right? Um, so Edward Levine says, is it absolutely clear that objecting to the allocation is not a contest? Ooh, that's a really good question. No one's ever asked that before. So let, let's, let's talk that through, right? So, um, hmm. So you're not contesting the trust, but you are contesting the division of assets. Wow. The, because, you know, so so Alan Cutrow was on this uh, Zoom, right? He may still be on. He and I litigated the Birch versus George case. That was before all of the... Um, all of the statutory changes. First, the 
the Pachigan changes and and now the 2014 changes. So I don't know the answer to that, but I'd love I'd love to have somebody's thoughts on that. Right? Is is a challenge to the subtrust allocation inter vivos or even post mortem? It, would that trigger the no contest clause? Well, no contest clauses, as we know now, are construed very strictly. So uh, Avalis versus Swearingen, uh, A V I L E S, that came out of my court. That's a published opinion. That's where um, where Arthur uh, King Yegan, I think, um, from the appellate court, said, "Yeah, we're going to construe it so, so strictly that if you just incorporate it by reference, it doesn't work anymore." Um, uh, I, I would use that, but I, I certainly, um, that's a really good question from Edward, and, and I would uh, i would do some deep dive analytic before I, I did that kind of a challenge if there's a no contest clause, yeah, I, I would not want to do that, on, on, um, you know, without uh, sort of walk into that pitfall, okay, Jeff, Miriam, Jeff's a great guy. Allocation is an exercise of fiduciary duty by the trustee. Okay, so there you go. So Jeff says, and Jeff is a is prominent lawyer. Uh, allocation, it's so he thinks it's not a challenge because it's just an exercise of fiduciary duty. Alan says, uh, Alan Cutro, I'm these all the heavy hitters are in here, right? I'm not sure contesting the allocation is a contest because challenging fiduciary duties to issues is not a contest. Um, okay, so that's. It's, we have two votes against. And then Ken Wolf says allocation takes place post-mortem. So how are you challenging the terms of the trust? You're doing a breach. So, so, I, so what I think there's where the question, Ken, was more like, but after the death of the first spouse, you're doing a post-mortem, but the trust, uh, the no contest clause, clause applies to both A and B. So... Yeah, but 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 I think I think Jeff and Alan have have kind of hit it on the nose. But those are all good thoughts. I've, there's such a brain trust in this room today. It's just it's you know, you're you're not going to get um, a, a a greater set of minds in this world than those people I've seen on our list of participants today. So I, I think that's probably the answer. But again, you would want to do um, a CYA letter to. The client, uh, and that doesn't stand for California Youth Authority. So um, I think that is those are the questions that I have. Uh, I sp again, I know I went through a lot really quickly. Uh, it's it, this is for litigators. So um, if you have questions at all, of course consult accountants as to valuation. Of course, consult uh, community uh, family law attorneys as to characterization. Of course, consult estate planners as to you know how and why they did certain things. Uh, the state planners do have courses on subtrust allocation, but it's really a deep dive into things like formulae and and it's um, it's you know it's over my head. And so um, it's 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 gonna be tough for a judge to navigate that stuff. So so thank you all for being here. Um, again it was a pleasure and an honor and I hope to see you all.